We have a gift today. We have guest speaker Paul Reed and Priscilla Reed are in town. For those that haven't heard them before, you're in for a real treat today. Priscilla actually is going to be preaching next door at Grace and Espanol at 1045. Paul's going to bring a word today. You know, they've been coming here to Grace Covenant for 20 years. Is that right? 22. Yeah. 22 years, which is insane. They planted a church, Christian Fellowship Church, in northern Belfast. Northern Ar Belfast, Northern Ireland. Gotcha. I know. Gotcha. I know. Um, in 1981, which was the year I was born. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love because they always say they started their church in their home with um, 11, 11 people. people. And then after two years, two years they grew it to eight. <laughs> And then, <laughs> uh, and then the, it did really take off. They're actually their church is really known for their worship pastor did a live uh, recording of Revival at Belfast, right? right? Yeah. Have you got who's heard of the album? Yeah, uh, the song Days of Elijah, right? Can't go wrong there. If you haven't heard it, get on Spotify, Apple Music. It's still out there. You can find it. It's really great. Um, Priscilla wrote a book recently, and I wanted to tell you guys about it. It's a poem book, it's a poetry book called Love the Thread, Poems from My Heart to Yours. And you can get that on their website, paulandpriscillareed.com. It's a great Christmas gift, so buy it up. And yeah, I know you should have brought some, but you can get it online. Paul is doing something really cool right now too. He's the chaplain of their local professional football team, which is soccer. Um, <laughs> And <laughs> he's crushing He's got some cool stories there. So anyway, we just wanted to honor you both. Okay, We're so glad you you're so here much, today. Sarah. Give us the word. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. One, two. Uh, one, two, one, two, one, two. Hello. Good morning. Am I? Morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Anyway, thank you so much for that welcome, Sarah. Yeah, my, uh, my being the, the chaplain of a, a football club, soccer club, is, uh, it's, been the, it's been the best fun that, I, that I've ever done in my life, to be honest with you. I learned some new words, actually. <laughs> it's been really it's been very interesting. I could tell you some stories about those guys. Um, yeah, it's, it's we, I, I first came to speak here uh, in February uh, 2001. And uh, I stayed with uh, Jeannie and Robert and um, came to the church. I actually remember what I spoke on. I'm sure a number of you do as well. <laughs> Anybody? What? Actually, one of the things about getting old is that you, uh, you're at risk of scammers. You know, telephone scammers. Oh, no. they, they, seriously. So I got a call a couple of weeks ago, and this guy said to me, is that Paul Reid? I said, yeah. He said, um, we've got all your passwords. I said, Priscilla, good news. <laughs> Somebody's got our passwords. I said, get when I get a bit of paper, a pen, I'll write them down. Go ahead. Go, go. Hey, you got to take them and you can get them at my age, I'm telling you. Remember your passwords, you must be kidding. Anyway, we, where were we? The Bible. That's, that's right. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, talk, just go through the passage, John chapter 21. I've called it the barbecue on the beach, so I'm going to read most of the chapter. So let's go. I think it's going to come up behind me there somewhere. John 21, verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon, Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? It's, it's kind of guys, it's, it's a different, it, friends sounds like, you know English people, friends. You know, it's not like that, it's guys. And uh, it's a sort of an endearment. No, they answered, and he said, well, throw your net onto the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he'd taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, uh, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. 
And when they landed, uh, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've ca just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of fish, 153. But even with so many, the net wasn't torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? But they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And they did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. He said, verily, truly, I say to you that when you, were, uh, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted to go. But when you're, uh, when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. So the scene is that the guys have gone out fishing. And they look ashore and they see a man, and it's Jesus. The resurrected Christ stands before them. Now, he's the same Jesus who walked with them on the dusty roads of Israel. He's the same Jesus who healed the sick, who gave sight to the blind, who turned water into wine, who raised the dead. He's exactly the same Jesus. Except this, this time, he has a, a, we call it an incorruptible, a, a body which will, uh, doesn't know the, the ravages of time or decay. But he's still the same Jesus. And that same Jesus, a human being, is still a human being today. Jesus retains his human form for all eternity. At this moment, at the right hand of the Father, there's someone, a man, a human being, in charge of the whole universe. And last night as you slept, he was interceding for you. And he stands before them. It's the third time he's appeared to them, and after the resurrection, Peter needs a special encounter with this Jesus. All the excitement of Jesus being alive, Peter was one of the first to discover this. And, uh, and uh, as I said, it was the third time. But things aren't right. Remember, Peter has publicly denied Jesus, and that has to be put right. So what you find here, and you, you find it in John, that there are contrasts. Often in John, you get a sign in the natural is a sign in the spiritual. So you get, it says, when it says it's night, it's not only night, it's trying to say something. There's confusion. It's to, used to, the, the, the idea, light and darkness are used to note what's really going on. They're still in the dark. It's a sign in the spiritual. And then, of course, early in the morning, Jesus appears. The light, you get that. There's a lot of talk about fish. I, I love it. An ordinary scene. Fisherman, carpenter, man on a beach cooking a barbecue. Very unspectacular. But Jesus, uh, Peter goes back to what he knows. It's fishing. And I, I wonder, did he want to play it safe? You know, maybe after all the excitement of the three years, he wondered what it was all about. And he denied Jesus three times, not quietly, remember, but publicly. Maybe he thought there was no way back. And so what we're going to do is just go through the passage and learn some things about restoration, because it's a, it's a passage of redemption and restoration. First of all, number one, they fished all night and they didn't catch anything. Very simple. Why was that? Because Jesus wasn't at the center of their fishing. It's an interesting, every time you see a miracle, particularly in John, it attests to, to three things. Number one, it attests to the Messiahship that Jesus, this man who's doing the miracle, is the Son of God. And it actually, it, it always has a, an application uh, of, a, of, a, of, a perm, of, a, of a, an immediate nature. So when he changes uh, water into wine, uh, they drink the wine. But it points to something bigger than this. 
Okay, so, so, so th th there's something going on here which we're hopefully about to learn in a few moments. And, and every miracle points to the future. For instance, when someone gets healed, Jesus heals somebody. It points to the fact, not only is there a wonderful uh, healing takes place, he's pointing to a day when there'll be no more tears and no more sickness and a new humanity will be on earth and will be renewed in the image of Christ. So there's, thing, there's things going on that we need to keep our eye on. But it, it's funny, these are the experts, but of course, you know, they don't know, they don't catch any fish and Jesus isn't the expert and he tells them to, to, to kick it over the other side. And, and I think it's important because I find that if Jesus isn't at the center of what you're doing, no matter what the catch is, you'll never be satisfied. And I, I, I suppose I, I've learned as I've got older, uh, especially being a chaplain, I, I, you know, I bring, uh, you bring Jesus into every situation in your life. I learned this when I was a young Christian uh, and uh, my, my parents had split up and uh, I lived with my grandparents and I was uh, 16 and doing simultaneous equations. Anybody ever heard of a simultaneous equation? Yeah, every, I wake up every day going, another day I don't have to use simultaneous equations. <laughs> But, but I couldn't get them, I couldn't, you have to, and you have to pass this particular exam. And, and I, remember, I remember, you know, I was 16, I'd just become a Christian, and I'm, and I'm struggling, I can't get it. My grandfather came in, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm just struggling. He said, have you prayed about it? I said, well, can you do that? <laughs> he, said, he, said, he said, well, who do you think, who do you think invented simultaneous equations? I said, well, the devil, obviously. <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, hey. And... Uh, so I prayed about it, and I got, I got the exam. For, I, I, I literally, I'd failed it two, two, twice. I had to reset it three times. I, I reset it twice and did it the first time. And, and I got the exam, and it, it's a very important thing. And it taught me this, there isn't any part of your life that Jesus isn't interested in. There isn't any part of your life that Christ isn't interested in. And you know something this morning? If it's concerning you, it's concerning him. And he's seated at the right hand of God, remember? And he's interceding for you. Whatever it is, bring it to Christ today. The, the, the second thing, is it's, I think it's important, is that there are 153 fish caught. I, I, I love this. You know, there's this, the Son of God is on the beach and somebody's counting fish. It's just, you know, who does that? A one, a two, a three. You know, and you can imagine, you can, it's just the silliest thing. You know, you can imagine somebody getting to the end and going, did that include the six we took out for breakfast? <laughs> I, I don't know, you better start over again then. <laughs> a one, a two. It's the silliest thing. But it's thing, they didn't recognize Jesus, but, you know, when they, when they told them, you know, something, when they said no, you know, they, he threw the net over the other side. And there's so many fish, of course, they could hardly haul it in. And, and it's hard to believe in this momentous occasion, somebody is counting fish. Now, there's been a lot of explanations and theories about what the 153 fish represents. Okay? Now, some people say it is the number of the known races in the world at that time. Some people say it was the number of varieties of fish in the Lake of Ga Sea of Galilee. But actually, I've worked something out, and I just want to share it with you. Okay? If you multiply the 12 tribes of Israel with the Ten Commandments, you add the 12 disciples, the seven churches in Revelation, the seven days of creation, plus the ten plagues of Egypt, minus the Trinity, you get 153. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's as good as anybody else's. Now, for those of you who think that was serious, get a life. Okay? I made it up. But actually, the point, the point simply is this. Peter's hauling in the biggest catch of his life. Remember, it's pointing to Acts chapter 2, when he's going to get the bigger catch of his life. It's, it's, remember, in John, a sign in the natural is a sign in the spiritual and, uh, and, uh, and I think it also says that if you make the catch of your life, it'll never be enough to satisfy you if Christ isn't at the center of your life. So contrast again, James or Peter and John. Remember, John, it's the Lord. So John understands, Peter acts. 
You gotta love Peter, don't you? Jumps out of the boat. I think he always wore his heart in his sleeve. And Jesus plans a barbecue on the beach. Now, remember, he has bread and fish. Where did he get the bread from? I, I, I just bought, I, I, we're not told, but that's okay. Did he buy it? Did he go, <laughs> and bread appeared? <laughs> I don't know. But there it is, this incredible, incredible barbecue enough for these men. And then they get some other fish and, and they begin to talk. And I think it's important, you know, I love it that Jesus, you know, after they've eaten, it often does that. The Lord, you know, is concerned about our physical needs. You know, you eat, and then, he, and then he sits down with Peter, not in public, but he needs to address something with him. And, and I, I think it's true that whenever something's going on in our life and we choose to ignore it, he doesn't ignore it. He'll do something to get our attention. And, and he wants to, I suppose, just to talk to us about it and that we realize what's going on so that we can be healed and forgiven and restored. And then, remember, Jesus is recreating the scene around a fire. Because remember, when he denied, Peter denied Jesus, where was it? Around a fire. And then he denied him three times. So Jesus goes, a threefold question. So he's trying, to re, he's trying to get Peter to know, this is related to that, okay? And this is important that, that we understand that. And, uh, and in one simple meal, Jesus restores Peter's relationship with himself. And I love that because I, 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 there's quite a number of you I don't know. You've got a lot of new people, which is fantastic. But Christianity is all, and Sarah said it, all about relationships. It's about restoring broken relationships, ours with God and then with each other. And you've got a carpenter and a fisherman round a fire. And I love it that he doesn't say to Peter, I hope you're ashamed of yourself, mate. I hope you're repentant. I hope you're really sorry and feel bad about this. He doesn't do that. He just starts out with a question. And I think, he, he, I, I think the whole issue of love comes into it because he says to him, uh, he says, do you love me? But, but I think he assumes that Peter knows that he loves him. Uh, it's interesting, one of, one of the things I've had to do with the boys, uh, the lads in the football club, is that um, as the great theologian Woody Allen once said, 80% of success is just showing up. And so I go there, rain, hail and shine, and I know that when they've got a problem, they'll know that I love them. I don't need to tell them there's something wrong in their life. Those guys know that. They know there's, there's, there's the stuff they're up to. We lost two boys last week through sniffing lines. Got fired immediately from the team. Professional career over, 20 and 21. And, uh, but, but you know something? There's something when you know that someone is on your side and loves you. And I love it because it, it's, it's an interesting one for me because, you know, Jesus said to them in the upper room, uh, and Squishy alluded to it today, Jesus said, uh, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. So that's the baseline. And when God wants to deal with anything in our lives, actually, it's always with the assumption that we know that he loves us. I, I, I love that because I think it's important I saw a thing on YouTube the other day. It was a preacher who I have a lot of time for. He said, there's far too much talk about the love of God. He actually, he actually said that. I, and I thought to myself, that's complete nonsense. That's complete nonsense. And I want to ask you today, do you know that God loves you? He's passionately in love with you. I, 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 I love it, but I was thinking, you know, if I was, I, I, I've, been, I've been studying the book of Romans and, and, work, and, and finished it absolutely brilliant. Got a great book called Romans, A Letter, uh, A Letter That Makes Sense by Andrew Allerton. It's a, it's a fabulous book. So I've, I've, I put it on Facebook, etc., and, and Instagram and TikTok and everywhere else I could get it on. <laughs> and uh, uh, one of the things I thought myself was, if you were a slave in Rome, in the first century. Remember, Rome had a population of a million, of whom 250,000 were slaves. So suddenly, they, are, they hear about the message of the cross, and they, they believe in Jesus, and they hear about, for the first time, of a God who isn't down on them, but who actually loves them. See, if you said to me today, how do I know God loves me, Paul? I'd get the Bible out and I'd flick it up and say, there it says it here. They didn't have the Bible. 
What would happen to them? Well, when they heard the message of Jesus and they believed it, here's what, here's what Paul writes in Romans. I, I, I love this. He says, he says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So when they believed in Jesus, something happened to them. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they knew maybe for the first time in their life that God loved them. And, and, what, and what was their response? Well, Romans 8, what does Paul say? He says, by him, the Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself testifies that we are children of God. When they discovered and believed in Jesus, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon their life. And there was this an explosion of joy and of, he's my father. Do you know that today? Lord, would you bring your love on this congregation? That all of us, no matter how unloved and at times unlovely we are, you love us passionately. That's the baseline. And then Jesus uh, asks him a question uh, and he says, do you love me, Simon? Uh, uh, three times. Now, he, he, he says, uh, notice he uses his name that he used to be called. He calls him Simon, not Peter. And, and why, why, do you love me? He says, do you love me more than these? A lot of speculation. But I think he's basically saying, do you want to go back to your old ways? Your old life. Do you want to go back to be a fisherman? Just be Simon again? I think he's referring to the fishing. And it's a, a very important, uh, an important question because when you've had a connection and uh, an encounter with Jesus, um, you're never the same again. The danger is that you can go back. Uh, probably one of the greatest pains in my life is people that I've served with. And I don't, I don't mean, you know, made a profession when they were two, two years of age. I mean, I mean people who ministered the gospel with me and, uh, and they no longer serve Jesus anymore. And actually, they're, they're confirmed atheists. I, it is the greatest pain in my life. And I, I, I just want to put an appeal to you today. Please, don't go back. Don't go back. Don't, don't, don't go back to what you used to just to enjoy. There's nothing out there. Jesus is the only one who can satisfy you. Now Jesus then asked him a question, and I, I, some of you will know this here, but now, and I don't want to make I don't want to make too much of it. But he, there, in, in the New Testament, in particular, there are different words for love. There's the word agape which is the word that's used of God's love for us. And the word actually it's used of a, a, a man's love for his husband, for, for his wife, that's the one. Okay, can we cut that out of the tape there, if you wouldn't mind? That was a Freudian, that was a genuine slip. Uh, and uh, it's the word that's used for, and it's the idea of a, of a, of a love that, um, whatever the circumstances, I'm committed to you. So I, um, I, I love my wife with agape love, but there's sometimes, yeah, anyway, we, we uh, you yeah, know, there's sometimes you, it just, but because it's agape love, even I don't feel like it, my love is committed, I'm committed to her. And there's another word that's called phileo, which is Philadelphia, brotherly love. And it's a great word. It's not a bad word. It's an affectionate word. It actually includes the word kiss. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a very strong word. But it's different from agape. So when Jesus, when Jesus asked Peter, uh, the, the, it's interesting. Peter, uh, Jesus' word is, do you love me with agape love? But Peter replies with, I love you with phileo love. He changes the word. And I wonder, I just, you know, and, and the second time he does the same thing, Peter, uh, Jesus says, do, do you love me with agape love? And, and Peter replies with filial love. It's a funny change. Now, they, they, to be fair, they, if somebody's trying to FaceTime me, no, thank you. And uh, there's, there's this incredible thing going on here. I wonder, I wonder, is Jesus saying, uh, is Peter going, you know, Lord, I do love you. But because of what happened, I can't aspire to love you in all circumstances because when things were going tough, I didn't do it. And then at the end, Jesus changes it. So it's agape, filio. Are you still with me? Agape, filio. And then Jesus changed it to filio. And it's, it's, Peter, do you love me? 
And, and I, I think it's very powerful because I, I think Peter was afraid to make that bold declaration of love for Peter. And, and there's something very powerful about, about declaring your love for Jesus. I, I, at, the, at the age of, of uh, uh, where I now am, you know, I've come to the conclusion that uh, Christianity is, uh, uh, however you express it, and, and I don't mean to be prescriptive, is that it is ultimately an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it sounds feminine, and please don't get me wrong, uh, and it sounds it's men are uncomfortable with that, but I want to ask you today, in the light of God's love for you, do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? I've a, a, I did a week in a, a Bible college about a million zillion years ago uh, in the Netherlands, and I, uh, I met a girl, uh, one of the lecturers, and she, she was a, a graduate in a Bible college in Australia. And for her graduation, they invited a man called Edward Miller. Anybody heard of Edward Miller? Edward Miller's an American who in the late 40s and 50s went to Argentina and had the most incredible revival. You, you have a look, look it up, Google it and, and have a look at it. I, I mean, he, he filled sports stadiums and it took, they, they took away wheelchairs in their trucks. He preached to Juan Perón, who was the president at the time. Uh, it, it, was, it was incredible. And by this stage, he was a very old man living on the west coast of America. And they invited him over. And by the time he got there, he was on a walker. And they, and they, were, they were a bit shocked. But the graduation came. There were 500 people there. She said the mayor of the town was there. And, and, and the, they, they gave out the prizes. And then they invited Edward Miller to come up and, and to speak. And this old man, you know, got up and held the podium. And he, he looked down and he just said, Do you love Jesus? And they went, oh, that's a big one. Do you love Jesus? She said when he, when she, when he got there about... 15 times. They were hoping for the, you know, a little trap door <laughs> where the speaker isn't doing well and you need to get him out of there quick, okay? And uh, she said, 11 minutes. The only thing he said was, do you love Jesus? So at the end of the 11 minutes, one of the, one of the graduates started to weep, cried, sobbing. And suddenly the whole room, everybody started to cry. And he said this, he said, congratulations, passing your exams. But he said, if you never, you never pass another exam in your life, the big question is this, do you love Jesus? And he sat down. Do you love Jesus? Because he loves you. And ultimately that's, that's what the heart is of Christianity. Let me, let me just deal with two other things because it's, it's on my heart and mind at the minute and, and it's this. I, I think Peter had the face that he'd, you know, he'd, he'd broken his own heart and uh, maybe he found it difficult to, to forgive himself and, and uh, he, he could have justified himself. Well, you know, hold on a second. I was afraid you had disappeared. You know, I was feeling disappointed and hopeless and, and uh, I, you know, he, he could have, but he didn't do that. I suspect that he felt guilty and ashamed actually. And I think one of the things I've discovered in, 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 uh, in my life in recent years is the amount of guilt and shame that people carry around with them. I, and guilt, guilt is what, I, I suppose guilt is the, the objective reality that you've done something wrong and you deserve punishment. Okay? But shame is different. So, shame is the subjective feeling of, of feeling worthless. Not because of what you've done, but because of who you are. Guilt is acknowledging, I've done something wrong and I need forgiveness. Shame is what you feel about yourself, even when you haven't done anything wrong. In 1945, my mother, at 16 years of age, found herself pregnant to an American airman, born into a very, very religious home. And uh, she had a little boy, it wasn't me, I'm not that old, if anybody thinks that. <laughs> I have an older brother. And, uh, and his name was Raymond. I went to be with Jesus last year, I did the funeral. 
And um, when my mum was dying, uh, she said to me one day, Granny appeared to me last night. And I said, well, what did Granny say? She was hallucinating. And she said, Granny told me I was a disgrace. My mother, though she came to Christ in her 50s, carried shame with her all of her life. But the wonderful thing about the gospel is this, that Jesus not only removes your guilt, but he removes your shame. You are not worthless. You may have failed, but you're not a failure. Grace, shame diminishes you, seeks to shut you down. Even though you haven't done anything wrong, you just carry this guilt of shame upon you. I love it because, because Peter, Peter writes this in Scripture, 1 Peter 2. He says, See, I lay in Zion a, a chosen and precious cornerstone. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life, what you haven't done. It doesn't matter where you've gone. It doesn't matter if you carry some things and you can't shake them. You know something? Jesus can shake those things off you. He can deal with the guilt and remove the shame. There's no need for anybody to carry shame. Why? Because those who trust in Jesus will never be put to shame. When he hung on a cross, he took our guilt and he took our shame. When he hung naked on a cross, they shamed him. That you and I could be called the children of God. And so today, wherever you are, wherever you did last night, you can have that guilt dealt with and that shame removed. And I love it that Peter got restored. But actually recommissioned as well. He got recommissioned. You know, it wasn't, well, you did wrong, I'm going to forgive you, I'm going to wipe the shame away, I, I'm, I'm going to do that okay, but you know something, you'll never do anything for God again. Please, please, let, let me hear this today, okay? When Jesus tells you that he loves you and asks you, do you love him? If the answer is yes, you're not finished yet, okay? You may think you're finished and you're done with all that stuff, but you're not. What did he say to him? Feed my lambs. I think there's some people here today and Jesus is saying to you right now, you know something? I put a call in your life to feed my lambs and you're not living up to it, but I want you to do it. It's not too late. It's not too late. He removes the guilt. He removes the shame. And he says, feed my sheep. And he wants to do that for us today. It's wonderful when we're in a room where the Holy Spirit is present and wants to touch our lives. And just at this moment, we do want to take a few moments and let him do his work. And the wonderful thing about that encounter was that it was a conversation between Peter and the Lord. Yeah. And it wasn't public. And so in just these few moments, as we would just quietly allow the Spirit of God to come, we often do appeals in church. We often invite people forward for ministry and we're gonna do that in a few moments. But with this issue, the Holy Spirit comes and covers us and doesn't expose us. So as we all quietly just would bow our heads and close our eyes, I don't even think the Lord needs you to lift a hand or acknowledge anything, but accept in your heart to say, Lord, you know I'm carrying shame. You know it's because of something I did, but for some of you, it's because stuff that has been done to you. And you know, in moments, the Holy Spirit can come and perform a miracle for you. And in these moments, he can come and he can lift that shame once and for all. I just, I'm going to pray, but I would encourage you to focus your eyes on Jesus and the cross. And as Paul has said, he died there for you. You're forgiven, but he took your shame.
So why would you carry it anymore? My lovely mother-in-law, carried something she didn't need to carry. Some of you are carrying something you don't need to carry. And you might just even right now open your hands on your lap and we say, Holy Spirit, will you come? Will you come right now? We fix our eyes on the cross and we thank you, Jesus, that you died for us because of your great, great love for us. That we know you, Lord, and you've forgiven us. But will you come right now and make the reality of what happened at that cross where you took on board my shame that I would never have to carry it? Would you make that a reality in, my, in the depths of my spirit right now in Jesus' name. Would you come? Holy Spirit, would you come? And right now, he's washing away your shame. He's washing it away. I love you. You're mine. I have clothed you in robes of righteousness. The Father sees you in the Son. He covers you with his love. Fully accepted. Fully loved. He says, lift up your head. Lift up your head. Because those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered in shame. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing across this room. And even as you let the Holy Spirit continue to minister to you, could we all stand? Because we're going to worship in a moment. But I think the Lord wants to do a few more things as well. And I'm going to ask your ministry team to come forward. Because as we worship at the end... Here's your opportunity. Perhaps your love for Jesus has grown a little bit cold. And he invites you to a fire this morning. A fire to light up your love for him again. And he says, just come. Because I am asking you, do you love me? And I know you're saying, you know I love you, Lord, but it's, it's gone a bit dim. And he just wants to touch you afresh. And then as Paul said right at the end there, there are some of you here and you know you're loved and you're in church and you're in connection with the Lord, but you really think you've messed up so much that he'll never use you again. And he says, oh, I need you. And I'm call I've called you and I'm recommissioning you. Will you feed my sheep? You know, this church needs you to be fully walking in the call of God in your life. This city needs you to be fully walking in the call of God in your life. The enemy wants to decommission you, but the Lord is commissioning you afresh. Don't believe his lies. Come to the fire of Jesus' love this morning. And so we're just about to worship, but this is what I feel the Lord is wanting to say to some of you. I am for you. I want the best for you. I know that these present circumstances have caused you to doubt my desire to bless you. I understand the fears and questions that are bombarding you right now, but take a moment and hear me. I'm with you even in the valley. My promise to you is never to leave you. But I've, I've not promised that everything would always work out as you hope. Understand that as you turn to me and trust me, I will carry you through. And the new things you will experience in your relationship with me will be for your good. We're going to worship, but don't hold back. 
these folk will love to pray with you, to stand with you. And if you were one of the ones who also responded to the Lord lifting your shame, don't be afraid to come and ask the Holy Spirit to seal that in your heart as they would minister to you. Let's worship him.